So over the last couple of weeks, we have been in what I call a mini-series, uh, just three weeks of particular topics and about gifts that we have been given by God through the church uh, as a, what we call a means of grace, a means of grace. Do you, any of you remember that, that phrase and what it means? What is a means of grace? Do you remember? I see wheels turning. Means of grace. Yes. Yes. So a way God communicates grace through us to others and to us through something that looks rather ordinary but becomes extraordinary by the power of the Holy Spirit. So we've looked at two means of grace in particular. We first looked at the sacrament of Holy Communion and the ways that what we as United Methodists believe about the table of communion and how knowing that can help us experience God's grace even more. And then last week we talked about the gift of the church. What is it that we believe about the church and how do we experience God's love and grace through the church? And this week we're going to talk about that second sacrament that we as United Methodists believe and hold up as very important, and that is the sacrament of baptism. So another opening question for us this evening is, when you hear the word baptism, what do you think of, what do you feel, or what do you remember? When you hear the word baptism, what do you think of? What do you feel, and what do you remember? Yes, Dan. The birth of the Spirit. Yes. That's good. Any others? John? Yes. So almost it sparks that memory of the scripture and the ways that baptism has been important to you or the lives of those you love. That's good. Any others? Well, you came to the right place, Chase. You don't know what United Methodists believe, and that is A-OK, -okay because that tonight is exactly what we will be talking about. We have seen baptism happen, I think, in the context of worship when we have a baby that comes forward and the family presents that baby to be baptized. We've seen a couple baptisms here in this space, and it's always something that ex is exciting, at least for me. But I think there's even more excitement to be found once we know exactly what baptism is. Uh, it's something that we don't do as a community of faith every week like we do with Holy Communion. And yet, it is something that we remember often. What are some of the elements or uh, things that we use in baptism. What have you seen? What's the, the most common thing that needs to be present for baptism to be baptism? Water. Good. And how often in our daily lives do we use the element of water? Just name a few things that we use water for. For drinking, to sustain our lives, yes. Uh, what else do we use water for? Bathing. 
Washing our hands. Laundry, please. For the love of all things holy, use the water for laundry. <laughs> what else do we use water for? Cooking? Watering the yard? Making things grow? Hmm? Recreation. Relaxation. If you guys like the beach. There's something refreshing about water. There's, it's something we use all the time, almost without thought. And yet, by the, the pool, I hear pool, yes. It's pool season. It's, it is that time. Did you feel how hot it was outside? Yes, it is pool season. And so when we, when we encounter water, so often we just don't think about how we use it. And yet, just the very presence of water, because we use it so often in our lives, for those of us who even know just a little bit about baptism or are on this journey of faith, that is actually an invitation to remember and to be reminded of who we are. That alone is a means of grace. But in order to remember well, we also need to think about what baptism actually means. What is it that we are doing when we uh, sprinkle water or immerse someone in the power of the Holy Spirit? So to help, um, and when we think about this conversation of baptism, we also always think about it in the context of the Christian church. But this symbolism of using water to become clean as something that actually started long before the church existed. It, is, it has its roots stemmed back into ancient Jewish practices of weekly readying the body or the community of faith, a person who is readying themselves to enter the holy temple as a part of the process to ensuring that they were made ready to experience God or to offer themselves fully in that worship moment. That sounds a little bit about what we like what we talked about as we ready ourselves to go to the Holy Communion moment. So, to help us think about the significance and the meaning behind the sacrament of baptism that we know today, we turn to a scripture found in several places in the gospel, and John, you actually mentioned it earlier, the baptism of Jesus. And just by its presence that Jesus felt the urge to be baptized shows its connectedness to an ancient Jewish practice of cleansing. And so for, to help us understand and think about what baptism means for us today, we turn to that very moment where Jesus was baptized because it's at that moment where something about this practice changed. It became something greater and something even, even, even more different. Or that's... Even, it became, in this moment, a true means of grace, where the God who is present from the beginning in Christ communicated something to Christ and instituted this holy moment for us. So we turn to this scripture now, and we're going to read the full chapter 3 of the Gospel of Matthew. Because we can see that shift. I'll read for us beginning in verse 1. In those days, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness of Judea, proclaiming, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is, one, this is the one of whom the prophet Isaiah spoke when he said, The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now John wore clothing of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region around the Jordan were going out to him, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and the Sadducees coming for his baptism, 
in baptisms, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Therefore, bear fruit worthy of repentance, and do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our ancestor. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now the axe is lying at the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree that does not bear good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance. But the one who is coming after me is more powerful than I, and I am not worthy to carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and will gather his wheat into the granary. But the chaff he will burn with an unquenchable fire. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you. And do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, let it be so now. For it is proper for us in this way to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented. And when Jesus had been baptized, just as he came up from the water, suddenly the heavens were open to him, and he saw God's spirit descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from the heavens said, This is my son, the beloved, with whom I am well pleased. My friends, this is the word of God given to us as the children of God, and we say, thanks be to God. Will you join me in prayer? Gracious God, we give you thanks for this holy gift, the gift of your word and the gift of baptism. Speak to us now and teach us what it means to hear your voice well through your scripture. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. So what were the words that you heard sort of repeating in that long passage? Repentance. Is there anything else that stood out to you about this moment? Repentance. So from the get-go, from the scripture, we hear that there is something about baptism that is connected to repentance. I think what's important for us to know about this scripture, and specifically about the Gospel of Matthew, uh, is that this is a later gospel that was written uh, almost like a discipleship tool for this very young group of Christians, uh, specifically Jewish Christians, uh, who were learning what exactly it means to be a follower of Christ and the distinctions between Christian followers of Christ and what they had been practicing through the Jewish tradition. And for the Gospel of Matthew, throughout this Gospel, there seems to be a a sharp dichotomy um, as a theme between the kingdom of earth, what we experience now, and the kingdom of God that is to come, but also can be evidenced right now. The kingdom that is present for us and able for us to grasp, but also still coming. And that is evidenced in the sharp uh, shift here. The shift from John's baptism to the baptism that Jesus has instituted. A shift from simply water to water and spirit. In the United Methodist Church, we believe that there are three things that happen in this moment of baptism as the water touches the person's head, or in some cases in in various churches when a person is immersed and then brought back up. Forgiveness, assurance, and incorporation. Forgiveness. 
we heard that over and over again, this idea of repentance, that in baptism we offer ourselves. But it's, more, it's less about what we do in the offering than about what Christ does through the power of the Holy Spirit in the water. We believe that we are forgiven of all of our sins by the power of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit our past sin, our present sin, and our future sin. Everything. Because of the all-encompassing incarnation, Christ's life, death, and resurrection. In this moment of baptism, we die to our old selves. We die to the weight and the hold that sin has on our lives. And then we are brought up through the water into something that is new. And we are invited to hold fast in the promise of that newness, the promise of Christ's forgiveness by the power of the Holy Spirit moving forward. But in that moment, we know that as we come up, that coming up does not make us perfect, right? That's where this next belief comes in, assurance. That as we are raised, we step into that very first experience of new creation, where we are assured that we are children of God, and that our sins in that moment have been forgiven, and that we are invited to walk in this new way along with Christ. This language of assurance in the United Methodist Church is also sometimes called justification, where we are justified before God, and we begin a long journey alongside Christ, knowing that it, with every step, as we do our very best to lean into the new creation, Christ is with us, reminding us that we are loved, reminding us that we are forgiven, and reminding us and empowering us along the way. It's almost like that first deep breath into as you have let go of something old and taking on something new. I'm sure you might have heard a story several times in the life of the church of John Wesley's assurance moment. This language of John Wesley's heart strangely warmed. John Wesley, a long time ago, was the founder of what became the Methodist movement. He was already a preacher at this time in uh, the, the Anglican church in England. And he was already doing the hard work of preaching and uh, missionary work. He had gone over here, come over here to the United States and really failed at starting a mission in the Savannah, Georgia area and was uh, needed to flee from Savannah in the middle of the night, hopped onto a ship to head back to England, knowing that he was an utter failure at this and he thought at that point that his ministry would be over and that God could not use him. And then he had an experience of seeing uh, Moravian Christians have just the best experience of worship where they were fully present and fully alive and that there was something more that they were getting that he was not getting. And so he started learning from them and asking good questions. And he arrived back in England, and after several months um, of studying and uh, asking God why, why was he missing something? His brother had this, what he calls a conversion experience early. And John's looking at his younger brother like, you've got it, where's mine? And so he, through prayer one night in a church on Aldersgate Street, had this experience of assurance, reading, if I'm remembering correctly, some commentary on Paul's letter to the Romans, which if you've ever read Romans, it's not all that terribly exciting. And yet, in reading 
that scripture, John had this experience of assurance where he was reminded that he was forgiven and that he was loved. And he felt his heart strangely warmed. Now, at this point, John had already been doing the right things. He had already been baptized. He had already been preaching and to seminary and doing all the right things. And yet, here in this moment was his moment of assurance. When we say assurance, this, it's connected to our baptisms, yes. But it's something that we can experience every single moment of our lives. That reminds us of the moment where we were first assured that Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit, said, you are mine, you are loved. We can experience it again and again in our ongoing relationship with Christ through the gift of remembering our baptisms as we do something as simply mundane as cooking dinner or washing our hands or going swimming in the pool. And that leads us to the third thing. The third way that we are reminded that we are assured and that we are forgiven is through incorporation into this family of believers. Incorporation into the church where we become part of the family of God, the body of Christ, not only just in the congregation where we were baptized, But in the greater church, the church that we talked about last week, this universal idea of the ongoing, very wide body of Christ. It's a reminder that we don't have to walk the journey of faith alone. That when we can't feel God's love or assurance for ourselves, that we have a community of faiths that stands ready to remind us for, to help remind us of who we are. And it reminds us that we have never walked this journey alone. So as we step in to the new moment, a new journey, this journey of faith that maybe started at our baptisms, but is continuing today, there are people who walk with us, who cheer us on, in the moments where we stumble and fall and maybe take a step back, who walk with us and celebrate with us when we take a step forward. At the very first church that I served as an intern, as a pastoral intern, I was about to start seminary, so I hadn't taken all the fun classes where I learned all the right things. And... uh, I was still struggling with this idea of ordained ministry. Am I called to be an elder, which is the uh, pastor of a local church that orders the life and the ministry of a church that orders worship? And up until just a few weeks ago, was called to the sacraments, communion and baptism. Now, or was I called to be a deacon who at the time was not called to the sacraments, who was called to be uh, ordained in a different way as a bridge point between the church and the world. And I knew that I was called to ordained ministry as an elder because that very second Sunday that I served as an intern, there was a baby baptism. And for some reason, I couldn't stop crying as that baby was presented. And the pastor of the church, his name is David Beam, Uh, held this baby up and looked at him and said its name. He said, welcome to the family. You just, your family just got a lot bigger, a lot weirder, and a lot more filled with love. And that has always stuck with me because it was funny and because it was entirely true that In this moment of baptism, that baby was incorporated into a big community of love that would carry them through through so many different journeys of their life. More than just their parents, more than just their grandparents, but an entire community of people who loved and support them. 
And it's true for us today, for each and every one of us in this room. We are a family of faith together, instituted by the beautiful moment of baptism, where we are reminded that we are loved, that we are forgiven, and that we are part of a much bigger family than we could have ever thought. And that, I think, is the true gift. So thanks be to God for the gift of baptism. Amen.